welcome everyone to the last day of this marathon session of a conference. I appreciate all of you sticking through it and being here. I know it's been a lot and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce as our last keynote speaker, uh, John Broom, who scarcely needs any introduction as being one of the most influential living uh, philosophers. He's uh, the Emeritus White Professor of Moral Philosophy and Emeritus Fellow at Corpus Christi College at Oxford. He's the author of, I believe, eight books, mostly on normative ethics, rationality, and climate change, and uh, including some of the most influential works uh, in the last you know, 50 years in philosophy, and author of over 100 papers. And uh, he'll be speaking to us regarding um, uh, self-interest and climate change. And I turn it over to him. Thank you, Sabah. Um, and thank you for that extremely generous introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. If it is morning uh, for you, it's late afternoon for me. Uh, thank you for turning up. Um, I'm going to show a few slides, but not many. Um, so I'll try and switch in and out of my presentation as we go. And I'll start by switching into it in the hope that that works. Um, yes, that's uh, on now. Um, as you see, this is a scene of jubilation. What these people were jubilating about, this was in Paris in 2015, was achieve, the achievement of the Paris Agreement, which was signed by almost every country in the world. Uh, it said, this agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial levels. Well, you saw the jubilation, but actually those countries jubilating did not mean what they said. They never intended at that time to fulfill the agreement. Um, in support of the agreement, they made pledges to the United Nations um, to, uh, uh, as to what they would do to reduce um, their emissions of greenhouse gas. But those pledges taken together are far from adequate to meet the two, two degree target, let alone the 1.5 degree target. If all those pledges were fulfilled, there would still be an increase of 2.8 degrees by 2100, according to Climate Action Tracker. Moreover, very few countries are even on course to meet those pledges that uh, they made. Very few have policies that Climate Action Tracker reckons are compatible with two degrees of warming. In fact, apart from a blip caused by COVID, the world's emissions of greenhouse gas are still growing. Here is a graph of emissions. You can see they dropped in the last year, but up to then they were growing and there's really no change at around 2015 when the Paris Agreement um, was uh, signed. Um, the British government is my government is one example of um, a country that didn't intend to do what it uh, agreed to do. Um, before that agreement in 2015, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had made it perfectly clear that the two degree target could only be met by most, the most stringent efforts to control emissions. Yet within just days after that agreement was, was made, uh, the UK government drastically cut its subsidy for installing solar, solar panels. 
It also issued licenses for fracking in many parts of England with the aim of opening up new reserves of fossil fuels. And still within days, it removed the tax advantage that it had previously given to low emission cars. So those were three changes made within just days. It was obvious that the British government never had an intention to do as it promised. As the UK's independent climate change committee recently uh, reminded us, the British government loves to make impressive promises on climate change. And you know, it's now puffing itself up as the chair of the next uh, UNFCCC COP meeting in Glasgow, but it's not interested in keeping its promises. Australia is another example of egregious inaction. It has more emissions per capita than even the US, not counting the contribution that Australia makes to climate change by exporting hundreds of millions of tons of coal every year. At the previous COP meeting of the UNFCCC, which was in Madrid in 2019, Australia joined the villains of the meeting. It joined um, the, uh, U the US and Brazil as the people who did their best to um, prevent the meeting from achieving much. Um, the Australia before that had pledged to reduce its emissions to 26 to 28 percent below its 2005 levels by 2030. That was already an extremely modest target. It put its 2030 emissions above its 1990 emissions. By comparison, the European Union's pledge for 2030 is 40% below its 90, 1990 emissions. But yet, even so, in Madrid, Australia announced that it would use something called Kyoto credits to meet about half of the paltry pledge that it had made. Kyoto credits have absolutely nothing to do with the Paris Agreement, and that manoeuvre was almost universally recognised as simple double counting, uh, a sort of uh, cheating. Moreover, although the Australian government asserts that it's on track to meet its pledge uh, at a canter, as it put it, there's actually no evidence of that at all. Australia's emissions have been increasing, again, apart from a blip caused by COVID, they've been increasing uh, ever since the coalition government repealed Australia's carbon tax in 2013. Now that's very striking because Australia is particularly vulnerable to climate change. Australians live on the narrow fringes of a hot, dry continent, which is expected to become hotter and drier. While the Australian delegates were speaking in Madrid, uh, in their villainous way, um, back home, their country was on fire. I'm going to put up a, another photo now. This is a picture of Australia uh, on um, fire. This particular fire drove a thousand people onto the beach from where they had to be rescued by the Navy, as though it was a wartime uh, evacuation. Um, I'm sorry to dwell on Australian fires when I'm speaking in uh, California rather than Californian ones, but it is the Australian government that I'm meaning to talk about at the moment. And it's also true that the extent of the fires in Australia during that fire season, this is 2019 to 2020, was stupendous. Um, 18.6 million hectares of Australia burnt. That's equivalent to about 44% of the entire area of California. In the worst uh, years for California, about 4 million hectares uh, have, been, have been burnt. So this is stupendously more uh, than that. Many people assume that when things get bad enough, our governments will eventually take action against climate change. 
But the Australian Prime Minister at the time, and still, uh, Scott Morrison, uh, said during the fires, this, these were his words, he said he would not be pushed by environmentalists into making reckless cuts in the coal industry. The Australian government is still opening a vast new coal mine in Queensland. Although the Australian people favor a, a commitment, favor that the government should make a commitment to achieving net zero of emissions by 2050, the government itself is still refusing to make that commitment against the wishes of the large majority of the uh, public. Why not? Well, it's because of the tremendous power of the coal lobby in Australia. Coal is the country's second largest export and it directly employs nearly 40,000 people. And this gives it immense political power. I'm, so I'm reminding you of some depressing facts about the behavior of governments. And I've got two reasons for doing that. Um, the first is um, to make it clear that the international effort to bring climate change under control is failing. Um, this effort has been in train since the, at least since the Rio Earth Summit, which was in 1992, but after 30 years, emissions of greenhouse gas are still growing. That effort, which is failing, has so far rested on a moral uh, appeal. Um, because of the greenhouse gas effect, our emissions of greenhouse gas are causing great harm to other people. On simple moral grounds, therefore, we should reduce them. We should not cause harm to other people by emitting greenhouse gas. And that's well recognized as a modern moral imperative. Um, 15 years ago, the Stern Review on the economics of climate change recommended the present generation to sacrifice a small amount of our consumption for the sake of bringing a much greater benefit to future people. Why should we do that? Why should we sacrifice any of our present consumption? Well, obviously it's only because of our moral responsibility towards future people. And that was the responsibility that Stern was appealing to. Now, much more recently, uh, Greta Thunberg makes the same moral demand and she does so with immense force and indignation. She can do that because she is a living representative of the generations that climate change is harming and going to harm. How dare you, she says. Uh, I'll just put up this quote again, if I may. How dare you? You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The idea, eyes of all future, generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. And she's clearly right. Climate change is a great moral wrong that's perpetrated by some people on others. And in particular, it's perpetrated by the old upon the young. Um, so, uh, her moral appeal is certainly very well justified. I wouldn't say anything against what she says. However, this moral appeal has not and is not proving effective enough to bring climate change under control. Climate change is not coming under control. It's true that many individuals are moved by morality. Uh, many of the moral philosophers who work on climate change aim to persuade us that we should lead an environmentally more virtuous life. And many of us do as they and Thunberg and others recommend. We're willing to make a sacrifice for the sake of future people. 
we insulate our houses, we eat less meat, we reduce our travel, and so on, all for the sake of bringing some benefit to people in the future. But I'm sorry to say that individual morality is never going to solve the problem of climate change, just because not enough people will do as morality requires of them. Uh, there are many people who are affected by the moral appeal, but a great many more people who are not. And furthermore, um, as individuals, we're simply not in a position to make big changes to uh, even our own emissions of greenhouse gas because they require changes in the economic infrastructure, which we're not as individuals in a position to bring about. So individual morality will not do what needs to be uh, achieved. To solve the problem of climate change, it's governments that need to act. They cannot leave the responsibility to individuals. Governments have coercive power, very large coercive power, through regulations and through taxes to make sure that everybody responds to the demands of climate change and not just the few people who are motivated by morality. So governments have to act and they could act, but the problem is that they themselves, many of them are impervious to morality. And that's a second lesson that I'm drawing from the sorry tale of the British government and the Australian uh, government. Governments prevaricate. They lie, they cheat, they make promises that they never intend to fulfill. They really do not care about the future. To some extent, governments are responsive to the moral motives of their people, but not to a big enough extent. Democratic governments are supposed to be responsive, but even though the Australian public wants action on climate change, the Australian government takes no notice. It's influenced more by the coal industry than by the Australian people. And of course, the largest emitter of all, which is China, is not even a democracy at all. I've got another quote. This is from the great um, economist, uh, A.C. Pigou, who was writing in the 1920s. Pigou said, the state should protect the interests of the future in some degree against the effects of our preference for ourselves over our descendants. It's the clear duty of government, which is a trustee for unborn generations, as well as for its present citizens, to watch over and defend the exhaustible natural resources of the country from rack, rash and reckless spoliation. But he, he was wrong, or at any rate, the governments have not taken any notice of this. The boot is actually on the other foot. It seems to be the governments that do not care about unborn generations, even when their own citizens do. Instead, governments are motivated by the great power of the fossil fuel interests. So long as there are powerful interests opposed to controlling climate change from the fossil fuel, governments will not act um, in uh, the way that they should. Morality is never going to motivate them. So the only way we can achieve a satisfactory outcome is to make sure that it's in no one's interest to oppose action on climate change. And that, I think, is what we should aim for now. We should not try to deal with climate change by asking people to make sacrifices. Instead, we should arrange the things so that no one is asked to make a sacrifice of her own interest for moral reasons. And if we do that, we can uh, harness the very strong motive of self-interest to drive action on climate change. And the important message I want to put across is that this can be done. Climate change can be controlled in a way that requires no one to make a sacrifice. And that includes even the owners of fossil fuel resources and the workers in coal mines. None of them 
needs, needs suffer in order to bring climate change under control. No doubt that will come as a surprise to uh, some of you. Um, the moral approach has been pursued for so long in climate change that we're used to thinking that the current generation has to make a sacrifice for the sake of the future. But actually, that's not so. There's so much benefit to be achieved um, by bringing climate change under control that it can be, there's enough for it to go around everybody. It can be distributed across all the people and all the generations in such a way that none of them will end up any worse off by the process of controlling climate change. It does have to be, this, this benefit will have to be distributed correctly. We'll have to take pains to make sure that it's properly distributed um, because um, if we were to make a, a sacrifice of our present consumption for the sake of cleaning up the air, the benefit would most naturally accrue to people in the future. They're the people who naturally benefit from having cleaner air. So what we have to do is transfer some of that benefit from them, redistribute it from the people in the future back to we in the present in order to compensate us for making the sacrifice, the initial sacrifice of cleaning up the air. And we can do that in a way that leaves us no worse off than before, but future generations better off. So in effect, future generations can pay for the cleanup that the present generation does and still emerge better off having done so. So I'm affirming that. How do I know it? Well, it's actually fairly elementary economic theory. Greenhouse gas is what economists call an externality. That's because when you emit some greenhouse gas, um, your gas spreads around the world and it does harm to people all over the world and it continues to do it for a very long stretch of time. Those people who suffer from this harm are not you. You do not bear that cost. Um, but it is part of the cost of your emitting greenhouse gas. It's an external cost, as economists um, put it. But it's borne by the other people who suffer from it rather than you. So when you make your decisions about how much greenhouse gas to emit, you don't take the full cost of your emissions into account in deciding whether or not to emit because you don't bear those costs. The consequence, as the economic theory tells us, is a sort of inefficiency in the uh, economy. According to standard economic theory, it's what's called a Pareto inefficiency, um, which is um, a situation that's defined, uh, a situation defined to be Pareto inefficient. If it's possible in principle to change things within the economic system in such a way that at least one person ends up better off and nobody ends up worse off. So that's what inefficiency is. Inefficiency is a state of the economy such that it would be possible to make one person better off without making anyone uh, worse off. And according to standard economic theory, an externality such as um, a greenhouse gas normally, almost always, leads to a Pareto uh, inefficiency. So it's possible to respond to climate change in a way that makes at least one person better off without making anyone worse off. That's the standard economic theory. However, I'm sorry to say that that standard theory does not apply to intergenerational externalities such as greenhouse gas. Because our emissions harm people in future generations, people who are not alive now, that standard theory turns out to be uh, invalid. It's just not necessarily true that intergenerational externalities normally lead to Pareto uh, inefficiency. The reason for that is what um, philosophers call the non-identity problem. Whatever we do about climate change is going to alter the makeup and probably the numbers of the people who live in the future, of the world's future population. If 
a government takes any serious action on climate change, it's going to alter the way in pe which people live their lives. For example, people will find it harder to travel. They won't travel so much if we take serious action against climate change. And that will alter the way society works. Um, people will live more locally. They won't be um, traveling around so much. They will meet different people. They will have babies with different people. They'll have babies at different times. And some of them will have different numbers of babies uh, in the course of their lives. The result will be that the next generation would be made up of different people and also different numbers of people from what it would have been had the not been action on climate change. Action on climate change will change the identity and the numbers of the future population uh, of the world. And that prevents a standard theory of externalities from uh, being true. Um, the standard theory only applies to a fixed population of people uh, with the same identity and actually with the same preferences. To get a rough idea of how the theory is going to fail, take a very exaggerated example. Um, suppose that for some reason or other, the government's climate change policy causes the birth of more people who are congenitally unable to enjoy a good life. You can imagine how that might be. It might be that because people don't travel around so much, there's more inbreeding, um, so genetic problems come up, then the policy will simply not be able to ensure that future generations, that everyone in a future generation, will be better off than they, than they would have been. So the Pareto, it cannot guarantee the possibility of a Pareto improvement. So the standard economic theory needs repair. But actually, it can be repaired. Um, uh, uh, we simply need to adopt a different notion of efficiency. It needs to be a notion of efficiency that's not based on the well-being of future people, but instead on the resources that are available to future people. Um, political philosophers are familiar with this move um, to, to become go resources, as, as they put it. Um, pay attention to resources that are available to people rather than the well-being that they get from uh, those um, resources. And if we concentrate on resources, we can say, uh, have come up with a new definition of, definition of efficiency. We can say that a situation is inefficient if it's possible to change things in the economy so as to make, um, to, to make it so that some existing people are better off, uh, no existing people are worse off, and future generations have at least as good resources as they um, uh, did before. So that gives us a new, gen a new definition of efficiency. It's a, a definition that depends on resources. I called it a resource-constrained uh, notion of efficiency. And it can be shown that externalities, including intergenerational externalities, normally cause inefficiency in that sense. And that means that climate change, the theory tells us that climate change can, in principle, be controlled in a way that makes no presently living person worse off and leaves future generations with just as good resources as they would have had. So in that sense, responding to climate change really does not require a sacrifice on the part of everyone. And later I'll explain in a bit more detail how that um, change the no sacrifice policy, as I call it, um, can be achieved in practice. I think our approach to climate change should be constrained by the condition that it requires no sacrifice. Since um, solving climate change, controlling climate change will produce a very great benefit, even if we constrain our policy by making sure that no one there's a sacrifice. Nevertheless, that gives a large scope for choices in how the policy will be uh, operated. The surplus benefit is available to be distributed across generations and across people in a way that the community can choose. It could be used, shall we say, to support the present poor against the 
injurious um, uh, harm in the, against the injury that uh, climate change is already being done to them, or it could be used to make life better for uh, few, future people. There will be these options um, of how to distribute the benefit. However, that is not enough to overcome two very strong objections that you might well want to make to my suggestion that we should deal with climate change in a no sacrifice way, in a way that doesn't involve any sacrifice um, from anybody. The two objections are that first of all, this policy will lead to maldistribution of well-being in the world. And secondly, that it will perpetuate injustice in the world. So we have these two problems that it will create, maljust, maldistribution and injustice. And I'm going to, those are real objections and I'm going to explain them and respond to them in turn. Take maldistribution first. It's natural to think that our policy on climate change should aim at the best possible result. We should try and do the best with our policy that we can achieve. And that therefore implies achieving the best distribution of wealth and income within generations and between generations. Our policy should aim at the best result. But the no sacrifice constraint will prevent us from achieving that best result. It will constrain us in some way. It will prevent us from doing the best result. And that means that we could, if we apply the no constraint policy, we could do better. So the constraint will imply some maldistribution. And that's the objection. And to respond to it, I'm going to have to deal separately with two different sorts of maldistribution, intergenerational and intragenerational maldistribution, both of which will are affected by climate change and will be influenced by the way that we deal with climate change. Start with intergenerational maldistribution. Several of economists have actually calculated what would be the best way of dealing with climate change. I said it seems natural to think we should aim for the best uh, best result, and they have calculated what the best result, the best way, the best result would be, and it turns out, according to most of them, that the best result involves the present generation making a sacrifice for the sake of future people. So there will be a sacrifice. It will not be a no sacrifice policy that achieves the um, best uh, result. They generally conclude that um, uh, the best, that the first, that the present generation should make some sacrifice for the sake of the future, as I've said. Um, so the, uh, the, the best policy, according to them, involves some transfer of well being from the present people to future people. But that's where we came in for almost 30 years the international community has been trying to achieve that result. It's been asking the present generation to make a sacrifice for the sake of people in the future. And the economic models have simply reinforced the point that that would be the best policy to deal with uh, climate, cha climate change. But this moral appeal has failed. The present generation, at least as represented by our governments, is not willing to make a sacrifice for people in the future. And that's why I'm now recommending a different approach, one that doesn't involve uh, a sacrifice. We have to accept that the no sacrifice um, policy will not lead to the best result, but that's because we're prevented by the political system from achieving the best result. What about intragenerational maldistribution? The world is grossly unequal. And that's plainly uh, an egregiously bad feature of the world. So if we chose our policy on climate change with the aim of producing the best result, it will be a policy that involved redistribution from better off to worse off people within the present generation. 
And again, the no sacrifice constraint prevents this redistribution. It uh, prevents us from asking the better off in the present generation, uh, asking them to make a sacrifice. So the distribution will end up worse than it would have been without the constraint once again. And this is worse from the point of view of intragenerational distribution. But again, I'm sorry to say this can't be helped since the present better off people, or at least their governments, the governments of the rich countries, will not accept to make a sacrifice on behalf of their population. The world is beset by many problems. Um, climate change is one of them, and the gross inequality in the world is another different problem. And those problems don't have to be solved together. And I think we should not saddle our response to climate change with the additional task of correcting inequality. If we do that, we'll end up with no successful response to either of these problems. True, if climate change were an important cause of inequality, it might be right to tackle the two problems together, but it isn't. The world's inequality, the gross inequality in the world, results from centuries of unequal uh, economic development and from a very long period of colonialism. Climate change is just too recent a phenomenon to have made much difference to global inequality, although I certainly agree that it is at the moment worsening global uh, inequality. So it's a separate problem, and I think that we shouldn't try and solve climate change along with that problem. Both of them need to be considered separately. We shouldn't sad saddle climate change policy with inequality policy. So in sum, I think the problem of maldistribution is serious and bad, but it's forced on us by the failure of the appeal to morality. Now, the second objection, which is injustice. When you do harm to another person, you do her an injustice unless the harm is covered by some exculpating circumstance. For example, if you do it um, in self-defense or you do it with her consent, or you do it as a just punishment, shall we say. But in other circumstances, you do, if you harm someone, you do her injustice. And our emissions of greenhouse gas, when they harm other people, are an injustice uh, for that reason. They are um, unjust because they harm other people and there are no exculpating circumstances. And if we object, adopt a no sacrifice response to climate change, we do nothing to overcome that injustice which climate change is doing. And that's the objection. And it's a correct objection and a serious uh, objection. Compare another case. Um, a slave owner obviously inflicts injustice on her slaves. But now suppose she frees the slaves and she's paid full compensation for doing so, so she ends up no worse off as a result. The slaves are free, which is obviously better for them, and the slave owner is no worse off because she's fully compensated. So there's no, been no sacrifice as a result of that transaction of compensated emancipation. This was the British government um, uh, approach to emancipation in the 19th century. So there's been no sacrifice, but obviously the injustice has not been overcome. The slave owner was in a position of unjust ad advantage over her slaves beforehand, and the payment of compensation simply perpetuates her unjust advantage. And the no sacrifice constraint is like though, that. Those who emit greenhouse gas unjustly inflict harm on other people. Under a no sacrifice economy, uh, policy, they're paid enough to um, make it worth their while to stop their emissions. And this perpetuates their un the unjust advantage that they achieve by making emissions in the first place. So it's just like compensated uh, emancipation in that respect. So it does perpetuate the injustice. And furthermore, it perpetuates some pretty bad injustice. Among the people who cause harm by emitting greenhouse gas, some of them do it knowingly 
and they do it on a very large scale. And at the moment, they're doing everything they can to continue the harm that they are doing. I'm thinking of the leaders of the fossil fuel industry. Several of them are bad people. They tell lies about climate change and they pay others to tell lies about climate change. The Koch family, for instance, owners of giant fossil fuel company, spent $168 million up to 2018 funding groups that engage in climate denial. Justice requires people like this should be punished for their unjust act, but under a no sacrifice policy, they will be rewarded. I must say, I think this is the worst feature of a no sacrifice policy. It sticks in the gullet, but I think we have to swallow it. These people have the power to prevent us from controlling climate change because of the extraordinary influence that they have over our governments. They hold us to ransom. And I'm sorry to say we have to pay the ransom. We have to buy out the fossil fuel interests, and this will be part of a no, no, um, uh, no sacrifice approach to dealing with climate change. Now, more pra practical question. I claimed on purely theoretical grounds that a no sacrifice policy is possible. But you might reasonably wonder how, how is it possible? I said that since the benefits of controlling climate change naturally occur to future generations, a no sacrifice policy will involve transferring those benefits back to presently living people. And you could ask, well, how do benefits get transferred backwards in time? Well, actually that is not a difficult question to answer. We transfer benefits backwards in time by not transferring benefits forwards in time. We of the present generation control the resources of the world, and some of those resources we leave to be made available to future people. We consume some, but we pass others uh, along. And if we choose, we can hold back a bigger proportion of those resources for ourselves. So we can bring benefit back to us. How can we manage that in practice? Well, there are some things to say about it. First of all, the economy will have to be reasonably efficient. Uh, any economy knows that when we're dealing with an externality, we can't hope to achieve efficiency um, unless the externality is internalized, as economists say. And that means that the external cost, which the greenhouse gas uh, has, the harm it does to other people, has to be brought home to the person who emits the greenhouse gas in the first place. She, it has to cost her to emit the greenhouse gas. It has to cost her an amount that's equal to the harm that the gas does to other people. That is internalization of the external cost. That's to say there must be a carbon price that's equal to the uh, external cost. How do we set a price on carbon? Well, there's more than one way uh, of, of doing it, but one is to have a tax on carbon. This provides an incentive for consumers to consume less carbon intensive goods. And if the tax rate is right, it will need to move us towards efficiency, which as I said, is going to be necessary if we're to have a no sacrifice uh, solution. But imposing a carbon tax does not by itself make everybody better off. In fact, it harms some people, it harms the people in the present generation who find themselves paying the tax and it harms the producers of carbon, of fossil fuels, who uh, find that they lose a the market because people are um, not buying so much carbon, in many carbon intensive goods. So imposing a carbon tax and doing nothing else in making in demands make a sacrifice on the part of the present gen generation. Um, and they will have to be compensated for that if we're to have a no sacrifice policy by bringing benefits back from those future people to the present people. It involves a sort of redistributive tax. Future generations are going to have to be taxed in order to pay the present generation in effect for paying the uh, carbon tax. How do you tax future people? Well, that you do that by borrowing. Um, uh, government debt is, in fact, a commitment to raise taxes from future people 
in order to repay the debt. So when a government takes out debt, then it's taxing people in the future. And the government can sell this commitment uh, to tax in the form of bonds and use the revenue that it raises to compensate present people to the extent of making them no worse off uh, than before. Um, remember, for the purposes of compensation, the government already has revenue coming in from the carbon tax, which is actually a very effective sort of tax. So it can compensate people using the revenue that it brings in and also by borrowing, which in effect brings rev um, the revenue back from uh, people in the future. So government tax is a way in which you can implement the no sacrifice um, uh, policy. Um, how in detail uh, can the government use that tax to compensate people in the present generation? Well, one thing it can do is reduce it. Some it could reduce other taxes. It can reduce income tax, for example. It could do that. It could reduce income tax so much that people who pay the carbon tax are no worse off. Uh, as a general rule, it'll have to buy out the owners of fossil fuel resources. So it'll have to. Um, to buy them out doing a compensated uh, nationalization, presumably, of these resources. So that's where the revenue will go. Um, so we will have to do um, uh, uh, implement a no, no sacrifice policy by means of taxation. That poses a new problem. The no sacrifice approach to climate change is going to require a new era of increasing public debt, but many governments are not sufficiently creditworthy to be able to borrow more money than they already do. And even some governments that are well able to borrow are disinclined to do so. Public debt has a bad name in many countries. For example, in Europe, many European countries in the recent decade have been imposing austerity on their people when instead they could have borrowed at ludicrously low interest rates and used the money that they borrow to um, invest massively in reducing climate change. But on grounds of fiscal probity, they um, declined to do so. And their reluctance to borrow is going to have to be overcome. Well, I think there's a chance of doing that because fiscal probity has now been blown away by COVID. Governments are throwing vast amounts of money into fighting the COVID virus, and they're willingly accepting soaring public debt as a result. It may turn out that this urgent health crisis makes them realize that money also has to be spent on this more serious but less immediate threat of climate change. They may realize that there are worse things than public debt and use public debt to put finance into dealing with climate change. Uh, that I hope uh, might happen. So there is a chance, I think, of implementing this. There is one further problem though, and that is that even though rich countries can borrow money quite easily, there are a lot of poor countries that can't. They um, are not sufficiently credit worthy. And I think the only solution to that problem is going to be a new international financial institution that allows poor countries to borrow, in effect, using the stability, the economic stability of the rich, creditworthy countries. This is what the World Bank does. The World Bank was created in the aftermath of the Second World War to finance recovery around the world. And what it does is it borrows money using the stability of the rich countries who are shareholders in it. And then it makes that money available as loans to poorer countries who would not on their own be able to borrow it. I think we need uh, a new bank, um, a new world climate bank on the model of the World Bank um, that would achieve the same result for the aim of financing uh, a global response to climate change that does not demand a sacrifice on the part of anybody, does not rely on anybody's morality, but is instead good for everybody. I think that that is the way that we can deal with climate change. <laughs>
So let me stop.